everyone. Just saying hello to people in the chat. So feel free to post there. I'll talk um, kind of as a as a blend of me rambling and answering questions and some of the comments that might be in uh, the the chat so that people who are listening to this sort of like more as a podcast they don't have to like switch back to read um so we've already got a couple of people in the chat and um today's session <laughs> live stream was meant to be um mulberry silk spinning but I had to change it to linen because I decided I wanted to film what I was doing with my better camera rather than just my phone because my phone is okay, but not as good. <laughs> so um, I can get better detail with my better phone or with my better camera rather than my phone. So I got started with this, realized it was actually going to take much longer to complete it and thought, well, I didn't want to have to cut the yarn or make a small skein with what I had so far. So I thought I'll just I'll just do the mulberry silk spinning next week. Um, so I know last time I promised that we would do something a little different today. Um, for those people who are really not interested in watching me spin flax. Um, so apologies for that, but you know, sometimes life happens. Um, because of the rail strike here in the UK. Um, I was going to have a brunch for my birthday next week, but that changed. <laughs> so instead of doing it next week, uh, I thought, well, we'll just do it today. So I was out in town earlier <laughs> and uh, didn't get back exactly as planned. Um, and filming takes a long time to set up and everything. So um, yeah, that's part of the reason why we're doing this. <laughs> Um, okay, so we've got a few people, like I said, in the chat. Um, we have Sonia, Cheryl, Crystal. Uh, so hello to all of you. Um, I don't know what I'm going to be doing with this yarn just yet. Um, I'm just kind of spinning it because I kind of want to increase my skills. So I've mostly spun wool. Um, but before we get into spinning all this, I am happy to announce that I am fully open again, and what do I mean by this? So, I came up with the name Actually Dyed Art by Science because I came into hand dyeing yarn and knitting and all that stuff from a more scientific route, so that was from the back end of my first master's degree, my museum studies degree where I did a lot of experimentation um, with lasers and I needed to have surrogate samples or um, some like adjacent to archaeological examples um, for this purpose. So um, I needed to learn how to spin and to do all the natural dyeing and then I had a, a researcher at the university I was working at um, do a lot of the setup for me and I loved doing all that dyeing so when I thought well I'm going to kind of turn this into a business I thought well the hand dyed yarn is really popular but there aren't as many hand dyers out there and there, there definitely weren't back in 2010 that could replicate their colorways no matter the batch size. So um, I created my dye calculator um, in order to give people who want to buy the yarn but they don't know exactly how much they're gonna need for a project. If you are looking at a budget like me, um, <laughs> I really couldn't justify overbuying for a project. But then I would be stressed out thinking, well, what if I don't have enough? I can't get this again. Um, and then that's really sort of limit, limited who I could buy from because not all indie dyers would do this at the time. So um, I have 24 repeatable colorways uh, available on a couple of yarn bases. And some of these are already in my Etsy shop. Um, I have more to list. <laughs> 
So here's a little preview to maybe entice some of you, or for those of you who might not know that I do this, um, I do have plans to expand these colorways onto wool bases. Um, for those of you who um, just like spinning top, comb to top. Uh, so this is one of them. This one has sort of like some purples and oranges and greens. And then I have some that are uh, really mild in their colors and others that are much more uh, vibrant and high contrast. Um, and I know that uh, speckle dyes are really popular in the last probably five or so years, so um, I spent a lot of time experimenting with doing my version of speckle dyeing um, that's safer for me because I dye in my kitchen. <laughs> um, so, and like, yeah, this one I absolutely love. I, I just, I love how high contrast these are. Now, um, they will be uh, available for right now in two yarn bases, but I have a third one that I'm going to start dyeing tomorrow. Um, and um, I'm hoping to have more than just merino and superwash merino at that. Uh, so stay tuned uh, for more details about this. I'll probably announce more details on my Patreon account and then um, make them publicly publicly known, um, but I'm also hoping to have some perks available for my patrons. So there's some yarns. Like I said, I've already posted some. Uh, so these are going to be uh, going to the shop next. And then I've got a whole bunch of others that I haven't had time to photograph yet. So just trying to have a nice wide variety of colors. And here's a bunch of blues. I love how just bright this one is. I mean, I, I realize that I'm in front of the light right now, but it is very bright. Um, but it's not annoying to look at. Like some colors that are more on the um, brighter side, like yellows and greens can sort of take on this neon look and you don't necessarily want to go out looking like a highlighter. <laughs> So this one is bright, but it doesn't give you the same impression. And then I've got some that are a bit softer, so got these that are available um, coming up once I sit down to photograph them. And I'm going to do some more uh, complex colors, like this one. I really love this one. Um, it, it looks like an oil slick. So, I'm probably going to call it oil slick. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, pretty excited about that. Um, so like I said, if you want to check out my Etsy shop, they're only available there for right now. Uh, that's for a reason, and that's because I am testing these colorways to see uh, how well they are doing uh, according to public opinion, and uh, sort of feeling out names. Sometimes a name works when you're initially coming up with the colorway, but then when you dye it, it sort of doesn't quite fit as much, but for consistency, I'm just kind of keeping it that way for now. So some of these might be renamed, but I am also happy to announce that I did get um, that investment in my business. So I'll be uh, scaling up production and hopefully uh, I'll be able to see my yarns available in stores across the UK. Um, but yeah, so things are going to be really busy and this is also one of the reasons why I actually didn't get as much uh, done this week. I've got loads of stuff filmed, I just haven't been able to set aside enough time to do the editing. So I will be getting that underway, it's just not right now. <laughs> it's all coming. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, for those of you who are actually here, um, now or later, it would be really, really helpful if you took a look at the colors that I had available and let me know what your favorites were, because I'm curious. I sometimes get into that, st you know, sort of state of mind where I'm like, oh, they're so beautiful, but everyone's going to hate them. And I realize that people who are <sighs> neurodivergent um, can often react this way and 
even though I'm not actually diagnosed with anything like this, I still, I mean, it's, the more that I research about it, the more I'm realizing that this is almost certainly the case with me. And it plagues me all the time. And that self-doubt, obviously, is not good. So I am basically looking for a compliment. <laughs> so if you just want to see what's there, um, tell me what your favorite color is. Uh, that would be really great for market research for me. Um, so that when I get the opportunity to actually start contacting yarn shops around, um, I'll be able to show off these colors first since if more people like them, then it's probably a good set of colors to uh, begin a discussion with. So, um, okay, today we are going to be plying this linen that I spun over the last two live streams. So I spun one bobbin and then thought, okay, well, I like that. It was, it was interesting. I did better than I think I thought I was going to do. So I went ahead and spun a second bobbin and now I'm going through the process of plying. Now, I originally thought I'm going to uh, spin dry and ply wet. So I've got this, it's basically, um, you know when you're making um, like tea towels and you have some extra work? Well, I decided to make these little washcloths. They're super tiny <laughs> and I have two of them. Um, but I didn't, I actually don't really have any sponges in the house. I've kind of gotten rid of anything synthetic, so uh, we do all our dishes with loofahs. Um, so because I had this, I thought, oh, those would be perfect for um, plying. So I've got it wet and I've got my little cup of water, which is a bit murky now. And I'm just kind of like dipping it into the water and squeezing it out. Now, um, I watched Evie do her um, distaff day and she's talked about just using a sponge while um, plying in order to wet everything down and then she kind of smooths it with her fingers as she goes. So. That is the method that I'm going with, it's the one that I have chosen for this. And um, I know that last week I mentioned I was going to um, consider running, ooh, running the bobbins through again to get to the starting end rather than starting at the very last bit that I spun, I wanted to start at the very first Part that I spun, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it's probably not going to matter. And so far, it hasn't. There are occasional spots where I think my my initial spinning wasn't that great. <laughs> um, so uh, I kind of get like that effect where the fibers sort of just like come down and they form like a big ball of fibers, like not spun. So that creates some knots. Maybe there will be um, an example that I can show you during the stream. That way it's, you understand sort of like what I'm, what I'm saying here. So I basically just have uh, my forward hand that's close to the orifice. That's the one that's sort of pulling the yarn through my uh, damp rag here and I've just folded it over the top. I'll bring you closer. Oh, and I might have to lower this a bit. <laughs> okay. Ta-da! Okay, so um, Here's the yarn and my rag right here. And I spun it super fine. This is another reason why I wanted to use my better camera because I don't know if this one is picking up really well. But I basically have it set over my rag here and then I've just 
folded it over the top so that the yarn that I'm spinning or plying is caught on the top and the bottom with the rag. And I'm also, um, yeah, so I'm also um, plying opposite from my spin, my initial spin direction. So um, I mentioned this last week that I might spin it or apply it in the same direction that I spun it in initially because I've got some yarn that came from, ooh, I think it came from India. It's one of the charity shops here has um, like a fair trade agreement with a couple of groups in um, areas where women are often um, put in difficult situations if anything happens to their spouse. Um, and because they have children, you know, it just, it becomes a big problem. And so, uh, one of the things that they had available in the shop was this really nice looking, um, probably hemp yarn. Um, and it was really thick and I used it for wrapping paper for Christmas presents for a couple of years. And then, um, I had just a tiny bit left and I thought, well, I'll just hold on to this in case I need it for, um, my loom weights. And, um, I was examining it and actually it was plied in the same direction it was spun. So it looked like a single, but it was actually a plied yarn. So my initial thought to, um, Apply the same direction in which I spun it initially. It didn't sound too crazy after I saw that. Um, but this time around, I've decided to spin it the way I kind of like the way I would wool. So I initially spun it in the Z direction, so that's counterclockwise, and now I'm plying it, um, sorry, in the S direction. And then I'm applying it in the Z direction, which is the clockwise direction. Normally when I do this with wool, I do the exact opposite. So I'll spin in the Z direction and ply in the S direction. But um, I only did that because there's a lot of traditions indicating that because of flax natural proclivity to rotate um, opposite from wool, so, and not opposite from wool, but like in the S direction naturally when it's wet. Um, I just went ahead and did that, but um, I think various people have mentioned this to me. Maybe it was Crowing Hen, because she was here in my last session. You can also spin it whatever direction that you want. So if you are a crocheter or a weaver or a knitter and you're working with your own um, hand spun linen, just do what seems right for you and your project. Um, I think sometimes we get kind of caught up with how things are supposed to be and many times it's governed by cultural notion and sometimes depending on how the society is set up in in terms of textile production it might be better to spin one way or the other but there's nothing natural about it having to be spun a specific way um, so if you just don't want to spin it you know, the way I've done it, then spin it a different way. <laughs> um, yeah, so periodically I've had to go back and smooth down some bits. So that's part of what I'm doing when I come up with the uh, rag like this, is there's a spot that hasn't quite set down in the twist. So I'm just going up and um, kind of smoothing it down a little bit. I know it's going to be really difficult to see, but there's a spot right here and I'm just going up and making it a little wet and adding some more twist and smoothing it down with my other hand. And that seems to work 
most of the time for these little flyaways. Now, um, last week I <laughs> asked the question, how do you finish this? Because I know that you're supposed to boil it, or supposed to, supposed to. Uh, that's one way to finish the yarn. Um, and uh, I don't have washing, I don't have washing soda, but I have baking soda, which is also uh, fine to use. So when I'm all done, I'm going to skein it up. Um, I'll probably have about, I don't know, 80, 80 grams of yarn thereabouts. And so um, when I'm all done with that, um, I'm going to put it in this bath of boiling sodium bicarbonate water for about an hour, I guess, um, I think she said, and then uh, rinse it, hang it up, and it should be soft and pliable and uh, nice to use. And then I have a plan to make some placemats with this, because I'm not going to have a ton of yarn. And um, we have one set of placemats that we use, and well, let's just say one of us is really, really messy when they eat. <laughs> so this will help with um, the rotation, so they don't look absolutely... I always wait until they're absolutely horrific to look at, <laughs> and then I end up washing them. <laughs> But I'd rather it go onto the placemat than onto my nice table. <laughs> so. Oh. We've also got um, Jennifer uh, Brighty from, I want to say Brighton, but no, it's Bristol. I think you're from somewhere down south. There's actually quite a few of you guys that are from um, the UK who watch, which is kind of cool. Um, so, I'm probably going to use two strands per, um, uh, per slot on my heddle, because I think, well, I've got a 10 dent reed for my wheel. Oh, Lancashire. Oh, well, that's not down south. That's in the northwest? My geography is pretty bad. It's getting better. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I hear Lancashire and I also think about the cheese. <laughs> when I was first doing my math or my PhD here, um, I worked in a deli, so I was really familiar with all the cheeses. A lot of French cheeses. So, um, yeah, as I was saying, I think I'm probably going to fit two strands of this yarn into each uh, of the holes and slots in my heddle. So, um, every time I do a tabby weave, I'll do, um, I guess, two strands through the... Oh, will that look okay? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Hmm, I might have to think about this a little bit more because I don't often have a load of time to weave. Oh, Pete, Pete is here and he says, plying makes your thread smoother and using two strands for warp makes a nice texture. Yeah, so that's, that's good to hear. Um, I'm also a little bit concerned about weaving with linen because I've never done it on a rigid heddle. The only linen weaving that I have experience of was when I did my warp weighted loom experiments, which if this works um, uh, for the rigid heddle, I might spin some yarn specifically for experimenting with the loom. Um, but I know that it needs to be damp when you weave because of how tension works. And this is something that, uh, for those of you who were here last time, um, this is what uh, Crowing Hen alluded to. Oh no, it was on... Um, so I have a, a community video where I talk about 
some of the questions I've had with spinning flax um, wet or dry and when you are weaving with it. I've also experimented with um, weaving flax or linen on the warp wetted loom both wet and dry and I found that when I tried to do it wet it just stuck to itself and was really horrible. When I wove it dry it was totally fine but this is also the difference between uh, what a warp weighted loom does in terms of how it, how it tensions the yarn versus a, a rigid heddle where it's held at both ends with no give in between. So um, yeah, obviously it's going to matter which method of weaving you're using. Uh, I don't want to go through all this effort, get a loom set up, start weaving, and then all of a sudden I come back to it and a bunch of the warps have snapped. <laughs> yes, Northwest, okay. So I guess my geography isn't too bad. For some reason I was thinking you were down south. Maybe it's because I want to move down south. <laughs> it's so nice down there. Um, okay. So Sonia's saying if I want um, double strand weft uh, to use two shuttles, that's sort of what I was thinking about doing because I've got, um, I have two shuttles the same length for my, um, it's a 32 inch Kromsky harp loom that I have. So I think I might um, do that. Would it still look okay if it was a single? I don't know, if it was just a single yarn. I suppose that would make it more warp-faced. Weaving is still kind of new to me. <laughs> I, I know how to do the basic stuff. <laughs> but um, sort of having the intuition that a weaver would develop just knowing before starting a project, I would have to learn through sampling or just learning the hard way <laughs> or asking questions about this stuff to people who probably know more than me. Um, okay, so Pete's saying that the counterbalance loom that he has uh, created a better piece of fabric. I don't have a, a counterbalance loom, um, so I'm assuming uh, I might have to uh, think a little bit about how I'm going to do the setup for this. Okay, yeah, definitely try to ply the same direction that you've spun, because that would be really interesting to see um, how it works. Um, if you're um, spinning it in the in uh, the S direction and then plying it in the S direction. It just, it adds more twist to your singles in the same direction you've already spun it in. But it's sort of a way to make a really strong single, if that makes sense. So, um, it, it may not be as strong as if you were to ply in the opposite direction that you've spun it in. But it might be pretty strong in general, just because um, there's the two strands rather than just the one. So maybe, maybe. Um, hi, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> it's just what you want it to look like, exactly. I mean, I'm starting off with very low expectations, <laughs> as I have from the beginning. <laughs> Because, I don't know, I, I get a little bit um, too controlling um, and it has to be perfect and I don't know why I think it does, but sometimes I think it has to, uh, I think that principle for me has to do with the way I was brought up that I needed to do well um, and um, that's where a lot of my perfectionism came out and a lot of the anxiety that I have associated with perfectionism 
and needing to do well and be praised, which also might relate to the whole neurodivergent stuff. Um, so this is also a good practice for me to kind of relax and just let it happen. And if there's a spot that looks a bit ugly, it may not look ugly once I get it plied. It may not look ugly once I get it woven. It may not look ugly once I actually put it to use. It's just me being overbearing and causing myself a lot of stress and anxiety for no reason. So I'm trying to sort of approach this project with very low expectations. Still thinking about the process and everything, but just, you know, rolling with it. <laughs> so yeah, I've already encountered a few thick spots that have, um, not really upset me, but sort of brought me uh, to awareness over it. So I'm just trying to spin it and move on and pretend like it's all going to be fine when I'm done, which it probably will be. Oh yeah, so um, for anyone who missed uh, the start, um, I did get a uh, donor or a sponsor or um, an investor, whatever you want to call them, for my business, Actually Dying, because one of the main issues I've been struggling with is, for whatever reason, I'm unemployable, <laughs> despite having loads of years of experience doing lots of different types of jobs and being extremely well educated. Um, I'm only getting paid to work about 18 hours a week. And I, like last week, for example, I put in 60 hours. So I don't actually earn enough to um, be able to invest in myself. And what it amounts to is a really, really slow trickle. Um, so having an investor is um, going to be extremely helpful to actually helping me get the sort of job I deserve, <laughs> uh, where my creativity and intellect are rewarded. So, um, I, you know, I've, I've been dying yarn and wool for 12 years, and sometimes I've dyed much more during that time period than I have others, but it's it's also, you know, a lot of experience spinning and um, using my drum carter because that's also a form of color blending. You don't necessarily have to dye everything in order to come up with the color that you want. So um, I'm really hoping it's going to work out. and. Um, if you have any friends or family or fellows that you know that um, predominantly use finished yarn but they're not necessarily yarn makers, definitely let them know. Um, the, the price of shipping is always going to be a pain because it's coming from the UK, but I literally only charge what it costs to ship, so I don't even charge for the uh, packaging that I use. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's as good as I can get it. <laughs> Once I'm successful enough, I might, um, offer more shipping discounts like some of the larger indie dyes, dyers can do, but, um, yeah, we'll hope and see how things turn out. I'm trying to be as positive about this as I can be. Um, and that's, that's really difficult for me. Um, yeah, I, I did. <laughs> I learned myself right out of the job market. It's true. And frustrating. Um, archaeologists, we have to learn how to do a lot because humans are very complex people, right? We're, we're constantly doing lots of different things and in order to study us you have to learn and do a lot of things in terms of analysis. So I did a little bit of cognitive 
archaeology to sort of discuss elements about the way the human brain works and how creativity is positioned and the way that it can be cumulative through um, how people uh, learn craft skills, how, how you um, sort of get exposed to it. So oftentimes you have girls learning from their mothers or their grandmothers but there's nothing in the modern world that means that boys can't also learn this type of stuff. Um, in terms of textile-based skills. So, you know, in the past that might have been really important for girls to learn this specific type of skill set. But, you know, it's like... This requires having some working knowledge of psychology and the way that the brain functions and all of the stuff that I, I did for human anatomy back in the day, all of that stuff is really relevant. I also took psychology. Um, so, you know, you, you can't just think about archaeologists, well, not you, but like the world thinks about archaeologists as being only good for one thing, digging up stuff in the ground, and then saying a load of, it's ritual. <laughs> but I'm actually really well positioned to do lots of different jobs, but it's, it's difficult to convince employers of that when they see that my education is in archaeology. I mean, the, the job that I do right now, where I teach chocolate workshops, I have this whole discussion about exchange systems involving cocoa beans with the Mayans and um, it's very simplistically stated on this slide that I, I discuss, but I go more in depth because I know more about um, how ancient exchange systems and economics could function and why it's important to think about cocoa uh, production more extensively because it kind of gives you that sense of awe, right? It's like when you stop and think about how vast the universe is, you feel so small and yet everything is really significant in its insignificance. So, um, yeah. <laughs> and that's just me teaching people about chocolate, right? Mm. <laughs> I missed something from uh, Sonia here. Um, you have a big bunch of burnout velvet yarn and you want to weave it into baby blankets. Oh, that sounds really soft. Worming all over. I'm assuming you're talking about... Are you talking about like warp movement or are you talking about it sort of like fluffing up and falling apart? Um, yeah, so, um, let's see here. Yeah, so I had to, uh, okay, so I'm graduating a uh, month, which is going to be available via live stream. So if you are interested in watching me graduate, <laughs> Uh, there's there's a link that I can send out, um, so if you want to see me cross the stage and hear my name announced and everything, um, I'll I'll post that. <laughs> I'm actually only guaranteed two tickets, so I have my mom, her partner, and my partner, and maybe all three will be able to go. <laughs> um, so. It, it will be live streamed um, for those people who can't actually visit in person. So if you want to see me graduate, I will post a link if anyone is interested. Um, but yeah, Sonia has pointed out something really important. Don't, she said, don't cost cut yourself out of business. And that's actually really, really important. There is a tendency 
among crafters to end up devaluing their work, oftentimes not consciously, because they think, oh, I don't know, that seems really expensive. And um, they think, oh, well, I'm just starting out, so I'm just going to charge this amount. But what happens is, People come to expect those prices, and then it makes it difficult for you to find any kind of sustainability, and you find out at the end of the day, especially if you become really popular, that you're just working for peanuts. That's not sustainable. It, it's very stressful. It makes you work harder, and then you just achieve burnout, and that's it. So, um, I am pricing everything as sustainably as possible. Um, because I have a view to have heritage breeds as part of the repertoire that I dye, which actually is unique among hand dyers. So luckily, I live in a country where there's lots of beautiful wools available that are wonderful to dye. And uh, there's actually a mill opening up in Leicestershire, maybe this year, possibly next year. And I would love to have very, very local yarns produced according to my specifications. Because you can always, like these small mills are usually quite capable of spinning a yarn specifically for your purpose. So being a yarn designer, which is basically what a spinner is, I can spin up a sample of something that I have, um, send it to the mill, they'll take a look at it, set up their machines accordingly, and then spin an identical yarn to what I've made so that it's it's actually as customized as I could possibly get it. Which means you could have yarns for different purposes. Um, and it's, it's all made with locally raised sheep's wool. <laughs> yeah, that sounds pretty cool, right? <laughs> Um, lofty aspirations, we're going to start off with the, the stuff that's made in bulk in other countries and then shipped and imported into the UK uh, to begin with, but this is where I want to be heading. Um, just trying to think about more sustainable ways in terms of sourcing the material and working with it. So um, basically the more people who support me and the work that I'm doing, uh, the better. So, yeah, lots to do next week. Um, trying to get some of the stuff underway because you actually have to uh, book mill space in advance. So, I've preemptively done that. <laughs> so, we'll see how things work out um, over the coming months. Um, Okay, sorry, I've, I've been losing a little, little track, I've been losing track of the chat a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, so Chris pointed out that um, people who are really well educated and go into business for themselves end up being able to exploit both. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah, so there's this lovely article uh, written in 2017 that talks about when uh, textile production became um, a male craft or men's work. And that's true. It has been um, sort of graded into two categories. You have professional textile work, which is often men doing it, and then you have domestic textile work, which is often women doing it. And then there's uh, certain levels of prestige associated with each, where the men doing weaving in these workshops tend to be regarded as um, fine textile workers and the quality and um, value of their work is much higher and uh, widely regarded by society at the time than what women are doing. 
uh, which is often something done in a household. So I've, I got a little spot there. I'm just folding it up a little bit to get it into the ply. And then I'm going to wet it down a little bit more so that it sticks. And I kind of smoothed out that, that bit that kind of bunched up because when I spun the single, it wasn't exactly great. It was the very first time that I was spinning this. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, Pete, definitely um, that perception of uh, who makes cloth is a little contentious. <laughs> Um, yeah, the whole question of ritual is really interesting. So, if you've ever watched archaeologists on TV and they're talking about the interpretation of this weird thing that's happening, ritual, or the word ritual is often said, and sometimes it's difficult because if it's just something that um, we see as pattern deposition, we'll call it that. And it seems to have a significance of its own where we're not really investigating deeper what that means. So um, there's been a lot of changes in archeology span from the academic end that really hasn't trickled through mainstream media quite so much. But if you've ever heard of an archeologist talking about ritual, it's, it's usually best to take that sort of information with a grain of salt because you might have a morning ritual where you get up and every single morning you brush your teeth first thing. That is your ritual. Or after you've done all of your, um, you know, going to the toilet, stuff, you come downstairs and you always have breakfast, always breakfast first, or you always have a cup of coffee first, or you always start with a cup of tea and then you eat something and then when you start work, you have your cup of coffee. That's your ritual, right? Um, and the ways that we might see this is through the way that you discard stuff. So you, you might be able to see layers in your trash can of coffee, tea, coffee, tea, coffee, tea. And if we have some kind of known starting point, or we're guessing that this is probably the known starting point, you can kind of see how that structure in the ground relates to this type of human activity. So there's, there's a lot of stuff that archeologists end up saying that is sort of true, but it's often easy to, um, misinterpret because these terms may not be as clearly defined and sometimes archaeologists can uh, misuse them on accident, like not, not intentionally, but it's sort of just how we, how we sort of discuss these things. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it's all really complicated, I guess. Uh, to explain in, in brief, but <laughs> there you are. Um, so Sonia's saying about her burnout weaving issue is that the warp and weft threads keep crawling out. I mean, I, I know the type of yarn that you're using. I just don't really know what I would do about it. They keep crawling out. It, it might be that you need more tension while you're using the, the loom, and then you might need to beat it harder into the fabric, but obviously you don't want to do too much because then you'll make a really stiff fabric. So um, it might be worth just setting up your loom with a a very short warp 
and uh, having like two or three, like depending on how wide your loom is, just having like two or three samples going at the same time so that you are um, trying out a couple of different ideas at the same time and then just see which one seems to be working the best and that's kind of what I would do is test out ideas through sampling but it could just be that you need to hold it under more tension to keep the warp from uh, wiggling out like you were saying the weft is a little tricky because that has to be beat down into the fabric. Hmm. Interesting question. Um, oh yeah, so my uh, graduation is on July 21st. It's a Thursday at 10 a.m. which for you guys in the States, it's probably going to be about 2 a.m. <laughs> or 4 a.m., maybe 5 a.m. <laughs> it's fine if no one shows up. I'm not going to be upset. <laughs> but if you happen to be awake or if you are um, working a job that uh, has a different uh, schedule, then it would be cool if you showed up to to watch me graduate. <laughs> um, the the place I'm graduating is really, really small, so I think that's why they have to limit uh, the number of tickets. So, yeah. And because they are honoring several graduations from 2020 and 2021, there's going to be a lot of graduating happening this summer. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm catching up with messages a little bit here. Uh, Crystal likes to crochet with it. I'm assuming she's talking about the burnout yarn that Sonia was talking about. Um, so what sort of investment are you talking about to do that mill work to your specification? Right now, um, I'm just looking at uh, Shepherds to see where I might be able to get the fleece from. Um, so I've got a couple of ideas. I want to use Shetland because um, it's actually really quite nice uh, to work with when you get it straight from the fleece um, rather than having it processed into combed top. Um, so I could actually pick the type of Shetland flocks I want to use. So that means quality grading to a certain extent. So these would be really, truly heirloom yarns. And I mean, at the end of the day, if you're gonna make something with this yarn, I would rather spend a little bit more money for something that I know is gonna last a lot longer. So um, I mentioned, I think in the last stream, my Ryland mittens. I made those at the start of 2020 with uh, just undyed Ryland yarn, three ply, and I hoped they would last against uh, cycling, and they have, and they look still brand new. And I think about the investment that I went through to produce them, and yeah, it costs a little bit more if you consider pricing out the time it took for me to spin it and knit it, but they look beautiful. They've lasted. I haven't had to do any fixes at all. So at the end of the day, having these really beautiful yarns made out of wool, they're going to keep people warm for a very long time, multiple generations if you take good care of them. So, you know, I'm thinking about quality investment uh, with these mill spun yarns. So right now I'm just in that initial discussing options stage and looking for farms who have large enough flocks where I could um, have enough skeins produced. But um, I needed to establish some colorways before I began dyeing all that stuff because it's a lot easier to get a hold of Superwash Merino, excuse me, 
than it is, you know, these uh, flocks of sheep's wool that only produce one fleece per animal per year. And, um, yeah, so this is on uh, my to-do list for the future, um, assuming I'm able to get that far. Yeah. Um. Oh. <laughs> so Chris said um, that she knew a woman who studied dental archaeology and anthropology and ended up being hired by a petroleum exploration company. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not surprised about that because a lot of people in archaeology end up having to do... Um, field schools, and so you have to know things about the land. Oh no, what did I do here? Oh, there we go. Oh no, I made a little pigtail in the yarn. <laughs> Oops. Oh dear, it's getting away from me. Sometimes it would be nice to have a third hand. <laughs> Here we go. I think that pigtail might just live there forever. And this is part of uh, learning to embrace the lack of perfection. <laughs> uh, native burial or historical occupied space. Yeah. So, um, uh, when I worked for the uh, state archaeologist uh, before I started moving abroad and uh, doing more with Expertly Died uh, on YouTube, I had to be well versed in NAGPRA because we often had Native American sites where um, human remains were found. And as part of our uh, agreement, we could study them, but we had to uh, keep the reports uh, confidential and then um, once they were complete we had to give back the, the bodies so and and actually we I think there were certain limitations on the types of things we could study in, in terms of procedures like I don't think we could uh, do a lot of in-depth research that involved like drilling for DNA or anything like that so uh, we could do sort of surface assessments and we had a set amount of time really that we could examine them and then they had to be reinterred um, or they were usually reinterred by their uh, living communities uh, in an undisclosed place usually Um, where will I put the link for my graduation? I'll probably put it on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and I probably will put it on the community tab for my YouTube channel. Um, I might even also, if I, if I remember to do it all, I'll put it on um, the banner for my website. So um, they might actually have a recording of it available afterwards, I'm not sure, but, um, yeah, I'll, I'll let people know, just in case <laughs> anyone is interested. Um, who's asked, so does the mill spin the yarn? Yes, so they can actually, uh, some mills can do uh, all the processing, um, so you can just have the wool shorn direct to the mill, they'll wash it, card it, and all that stuff, and then um, they can spin it to your specifications. Some mills can make um, like rovings or pencil rovings. You can get a wide variety of yarn spun. Um, sometimes mills will, um, like the people who uh, either own it or work there, may also do dyeing, so they might have um, the ability to dye 
semi-solids for you. It just really depends on the equipment that a particular mill has. So, um, yeah, I have two mills in mind that I'd like to try and use and um, make yarns available that aren't normally available. So it's pretty common to see blue face luster and merino uh, dyed by hand dyers like me, but it's less common to see Shetland or Ryland or Manx or um, Dorset. A lot of these yarns may not be uh, uh, available in large quantities, but they still can have a lot of a good use. So the, the idea is to have these yarns available as bases in a limited edition sense. And then I die to order whenever someone says, oh, I want this color on this base. Um, and then I would dye it specifically for them. Um, I mean, I could sell the raw yarn if anybody ever just wanted it mill spun. Um, but I think the goal right now is to dye it once it's been mill spun and then um, get a greater variety of fibers available. Because one of the other issues is, and this is part of the reason why I do my Fiber Talk episodes, Merino is great, but it doesn't do everything. And I think exposing knitters and weavers and crocheters to different types of fibers will be really important because a lot of these braids that I've discussed in my fiber talk series, they're constantly threatened with obsolescence because they're not as soft as merino or they aren't perceived in the same way as merino and it's like they only become meat animals at that point. So I'd rather these animals have more product pro have more products produced from them than just meat. So there's a there's a reason to have some of these um, sheep around, and um, the way to make it sustainable is to make it available to crafters. So that's that's part of why I want to do this. Okay. Um, Pete has said, you, uh, I hold my cloth where the two threads meet and keep the threads separated. This way the threads get wetted and smoothed down before they are applied together. Oh, and you have a video of this on your YouTube. So, uh, Pete also has a channel called A Bit Twisted. So for those of you who want to see more about flax processing, uh, spinning, weaving, etc. Uh, he also has a channel, so if you want to put that in a, the comments or whatever, feel free to do so. Um, so you say you hold your cloth where the two threads meet and keep the threads separated. Okay, so I think I know what you're talking about. So like if I use my pinky here, that's going to keep them separated. Ooh. She says, immediately creating a lump. <laughs> okay, try this again. <laughs> so if I like keep my finger there, so they're going to stay separated. And that way, they're not going to pigtail so much. Okay. I don't know. When Chris said, when my neighbor's husband graduated to Lane with an MBA, she was the only one in the audience to cheer. <laughs> We do in the south. Aww. <laughs> that sounds
sounds very sweet. <laughs> Aww. Yeah, so I, I definitely know what you're talking about there because uh, when I graduated from uh, the University of Illinois, that's where I did my undergrad, there were some degrees that didn't actually have that many people graduating um, per class. And so you'd have just the one person um, from that degree. And um, because it, it might be a small program or a newish program, there weren't more people around to just congratulate. <laughs> so that must, that must have been really heartwarming. Yeah, so, um, like I said at the beginning, I'm going to post this video of me plying this exact yarn. Um, it's probably going to be more of a process video rather than a tutorial because obviously I'm just learning how to do this so there's a lot of kinks I need to work through. Um, so I'd rather just show you what I'm doing rather than teach you what I'm doing. But if you are a spinner out there and you've done a little bit with wool, uh, and if plant fibers in intimidate you, well, they've intimidated me too. So maybe this will be some inspiration to get out there and try this as well. Because I've actually had a really good time so far. I've had a couple of stressful moments, but overall I feel like it's been quite enjoyable. So I will continue doing this in the future. I may, I think I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think where I got this from. I think it was called wildfibers.co.uk. So I may try to get more of this in the future um, and do a different type of project with it because I could always use some more kitchen towels. <laughs> um, I have this one towel that came from my trip to Copenhagen. So back in 2018, I went to Denmark for a textile workshop with the Center for Textile Research. And I was there for two weeks uh, for that. And then I stayed a week, well, like five days, five days longer, so that I could uh, see what Copenhagen was all about uh, as part of a holiday. So, um, while I was there, I went to the National Museum of Denmark and they had these Viking tea towels made out of linen. And I use this thing all the time and I always think I'm going to end up ruining it. But every single time I wash it and I take it out to dry, it looks beautiful. I love it. So if the placemats do well, um, I will uh, spin up some more and make some tea towels because you can never have enough towels for the kitchen. <laughs> ah, yeah, so Chris has asked about Tour de Fleece. So um, <laughs> the answer is yes, I will participate. Um, I will post as often as I can. Right now, because I've been working basically from about 8 a.m. until about between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. Um, yes, they've, they've been very long days this last week. Um, I'm only able to spin in the morning, so uh, I'm actually surprised I was able to do any spinning uh, on this project this morning, or in the mornings this week. But I did manage to get that second bobbin finished, and I started flying this morning, so I was quite happy about that. Um, I do have plenty of bats in the shop for those of you who are still, ooh, oh no. It's come undone. That has, this hasn't happened where the yarn is just, it just, um, comes apart like that. But no matter, I just gotta find the other end here, which is 
hiding in the yarn itself. So let me find the other end. So um, while I am doing the the dyeing this week, I'm also going to be listing and um, making bats because I did all that wool dyeing <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. And so I need to actually get that out and available. Um, okay, so Blue Face Luster is a really wonderful uh, wool to spin. It's very shiny, it's very sleek. It's not as uh, frustrating to spin as Merino can be sometimes. My stated goal. Um, I think I, I keep saying this, I might have to, to go achievable, something that I think I could achieve, which is, uh, spinning every day, <laughs> uh, no matter how long, but just spinning every day. So this is something I haven't been able to do, uh, during the Tour de Fleece. Every year I end up spinning most of the days, but not every day. Um, so I think it will be achievable if I just spin every single morning. Now, I've done this before when I was um, doing my, uh, my PhD, probably like halfway through. I wasn't really doing as much in terms of writing yet. But essentially when I moved up to the writing stage, I just did not have enough time to uh, do this. And basically when I started doing more weaving experiments with the warp wooded loom, I was using the time I wasn't working on my PhD to do those experiments. So for example, I did those experiments back in 2019. And I remember my partner was waking up at 5 a.m. for work. <laughs> so I would, I would get up when he got up and I would weave from about 5.30 a.m. until about 8 a.m. And then from 8 a.m. until about 4 or 5 p.m., I would work on my PhD. And then when I was done with that, I would exercise, get something ready for dinner, and then I would weave again in the evening from about 6 to 8 p.m. so that I could, you know, complete the experiment. <laughs> Which sounds really insane. So basically from about mid-2019 until now, I really haven't had the time to to spin consistently, like every day. But I usually do have enough time in the morning to do something, so um, I do. So I think um, my spin challenge will be to sit down and do this every day before I do anything else. And once I do that, um, I'll be able to post to um, my social media accounts so that you all can see um, the tiny but steady progress that I'm making on whatever it is that I'm spinning. Um, I do have a couple of things for fiber top, future fiber top videos that I need to spin. So I've got my Gulf Coast Native that's ready to go. Um, and I've also got some white face woodland, which um, I was um, gifted by a shepherd who didn't know what to do with it. So I promised I would um, sort of tell, tell the world about this wool, <laughs> basically. So I'll probably at least try to get through those two um, wools for uh, future Fiber Talk videos. So, um, oh yeah, so <laughs> uh, thank you to everyone who has supported me in the last couple of weeks uh, by purchasing things from my shop because it is really keeping me afloat. As I said earlier, I'm only getting paid regularly for uh, about 18 hours that I work every week, but I usually end up working about 40 hours, or, or like last week I ended up working about 60 hours, and I mean, I'm also technically working today by um, kind of holding myself to a schedule so that, you know, we have this opportunity to talk about yarn and various other um, insights that happen while I'm working on this 
kind of like a stream of consciousness with the learning process, which hopefully is cool for you. Um, if you if you like how I've done this, sort of discussing my uh, experience uh, learning something and engaging with something very very new and talking about it because I don't I don't know how many youtubers actually do that um, but anyway so yeah I appreciate it uh, whenever people purchase from me so that um, because it helps me uh, eat <laughs> eat each month um, okay, so Pete, I'll have to take a look at the video you're talking about um, to see how you have it uh, set up. Yeah, there's so there's uh, you can kind of see how light these yarns here are, they're real thin. So, um, what he's saying is like keeping these separate before they come into the rag so that I don't have any issues during the flying stage. So he's got a close-up of that. I'll have to take a look at it to see um, more specifically what he's doing because my initial attempt was not working out very well. <laughs> so. Oh! Oh no, Pete, Pete was doing this at work. <laughs> well, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to to make some comments while we were working. Um, so, yeah. Now, next week I am, I'm, I think I'm gonna cut this here now because my hand is getting a bit waterlogged from holding that wet rag. Um, and it's also approaching dinner time here. Um, but next week I am going to have this done. Um, I'm going to film the rest of this little bit uh, too. Um, and then I, I will be spinning mulberry silk from the fold. Uh, so if you watch my bamboo video from a few weeks ago, I was surprised at how much I enjoyed that. And I talked about silk at that point as well. So I want to see if this makes my mulberry silk spinning experience better. Uh, when I've spun it whole uh, from the comb top, in the past, it's been really difficult. I can do it, but it's a lot more difficult for me to manage the gauge. And I have to really, really pay attention to it, which sometimes I want my brain to wander while I'm spinning, because it's like meditation. But um, yeah, so we're gonna see how that goes. And if it's, if it's a lot of fun, then I'm gonna keep doing it. And then I will show you uh, what the final result is from that yarn at some point in the future. Anyway, so um, just to reiterate, I've got a bunch of hand dyed yarns um, coming to the shop. Some are already in the shop. These are going to be photographed next week. Um, these are 100% repeatable, so if you want a skein now and decide, oh, I need a few more later, then you can get more. Um, I'm going to, edit. I really want to at some point do this with my combed top, so the more uh, you guys let me know what you like, the more I'll be able to experiment with that. Um, Tour de Fleece is coming up, so if you want to find ways to support me and the work that I'm doing, I have them available on, or various wools available on expertlydyed.com or expertlydyed on Etsy. Um, but yeah, so I will see you, excuse me, in the next video. I'm sorry, <laughs> I had a big, uh, brunch and then walked around town earlier I'm a little bit <laughs> burpy so I will see you in the next video I'm hoping to get the tutorial finalized and uploaded for next week I just need to do the voiceover so I'm gonna sit down and do that um, so yeah I will uh, see you later thanks for watching everybody <laughs>